Howdy y'all, I'm Jack, and today we are reverse engineering maldev.exe with Ghidra. You all have left a ton of amazing comments, and I thank you for your support. I love reverse engineering malware, and I love that I can take you all along with me. Today I have a software sample that is very special because, well, I wrote it. It is a very simple piece of software but it should give you great insight to what a simple piece of malware looks like. Okay, let's get started in reverse engineering maldev.exe. First thing you need is a Ghidra client. I don't care what operating system, as long as you have a Ghidra client, that works. You also need maldev.exe. I'll show you how to get that in a second. And I highly suggest you go back to my YouTube channel and review all the Ghidra and Crack Me videos. Here are some of the Ghidra and Crack Me videos. I also ask that you like this video, comment below, and subscribe to the channel. You're going to have to have Ghidra. If you don't have it, go to NSA.gov and also jump back and look at my video that teaches you how to install Ghidra. We are going to need maldev.exe. This program is a client-side program that establishes a TCP connection with a remote server. This command and control server issues commands to maldev. Maldev performs the commands and returns the information back to the server. You can get maldev at github.com forward slash striker 2k2. And this is just for research purposes only. Don't try to weaponize this. All right, let's get to it. All right, let's see what maldev.exe does live. So on the left side of your screen, I have my controller. And on the right side of your screen, I have the victim that is going to be infected with maldev.exe. So the controller on the left side is currently listening on port 8080, and it has these available commands, and it's waiting on a connection. So when I run maldev.exe, this window is going to pop open. This is for research purposes only. So I'm making it very obvious that this is happening. We're not trying to hide anything at this point of the game. All right, so it's attempting to connect to this IP and it has connected and it's waiting for a command. So over here on my controller, I'm gonna go ahead and accept the fact that a slave is connected. I'm gonna hit enter. Then I'm gonna start passing commands. I'm gonna pass off the first one, who am I? And maldev.exe receives who am I and it replies back with when victim that is the name of of the user on that box and then let's go ahead and do the next command pwd for for working directory in which we see that it returned back that the malware is currently being launched from the desktop all right it recognizes it over here and it displays it over here on the server let's go ahead and check out the host name host name is win victim pc and then with this uh, controller, I can also do a disconnect and it disappears over there. So something else is I'm going to go ahead and reestablish that communication. And let's go ahead and take a look at what happens on the victim machine. We see that maldev.exe is launched and a new con host or a new command prompt has been, has been launched as well. So that is what the victim can see if they're actually looking in their task manager. Let's see what maldev looks like underneath the hood. First off, let's jump into Firefox, or whatever internet browser you want to use. Let's go to github.com forward slash striker 2k2. Once you get to this page, go ahead and click on repositories. Click on Ghidra reverse maldev. Read over the readme file and ensure that you understand what this program is used for and then click on maldev.exe and then click on the download button I recommend you download it to the desktop if you already have it on the desktop replace it if not then you shouldn't see that error I'm going to minimize our browser and then we'll take maldev.exe and put it into a project I created a project called Maldev. 
I'm going to drag maldev.exe in there. And once I drag it, it's going to ask me for the format, the language, destination, folder, and program name. I'm going to click OK. And then on this screen, I'm going to double check that everything is OK. We're using a little Indian, maldev.exe, Windows x86. Everything looks good. Click OK. Once that's done, we're going to double click on maldev.exe or drag and drop it onto the Ghidra Dragon. It says that it has not been analyzed and if we would like to analyze it now, we're going to go ahead and click yes. In order to prevent any errors from occurring, I'm going to scroll down here to PDB. We don't need that for this. I'm going to go ahead and uncheck the Windows 86 RTTI analyzer, but I am going to check the Windows PE X86 propagate external parameters. We're going to analyze this and we are going to wait patiently for the analytical portion to finish. After about 60 seconds of analyzing, we'll be ready to go. So first thing I always like to do is I come over to the symbol tree and I click on imports and I take a look at what imports we have. So it seems that we have ADV API in which it, it is going to import git username. We also have kernel 32. We see a couple interesting ones in here. Um, alloc console, so it is going to allocate a command prompt. We have git command line, git computer name, git directory. All these are starting to look familiar, correct? What else do we got? We got this one, it's pretty standard. User 32, we're going to find window and show window. That is going to be once again for the command prompts. And then WS2, that is WinSocket2, in which we are going to be importing a lot of the WinSocket properties and functions so we can establish a connection between server and victim, or server and client. So after I check out imports, I look at exports. There is one entry point, and that is where I'm going to be entering from. There's all the functions. And then of course, label classes and namespaces. So when you bring up your, your Ghidra, you are more than likely going to have your decompiler over here in this pane. And you're gonna have your main assembly code smack dab in the center. And if you hover above it, it's gonna pop up with even more information. Well, even though I am adequate in assembly, I prefer seeing everything in C code. So I'm taking this decompiler, I'm dragging it up here from the top bar and I'm smack, placing it smack dab in the center of my assembly code and I'm gonna make it bigger. And that leaves this over here that I can have my function graph and my defined strings. So I'm gonna take a real quick look at the strings. So there's some things that are interesting in here. For example, we have the CRT, which is gonna be the, the C runtime. We also see that we got libgcc, so this was compiled with gcc. We see some strings to include for researchers purposes. For more information, see the YouTube channel at that link. We have an IP, we have attempting to connect, connect, waiting for command. These are all things that we saw in maldev.exe. So we are reverse engineering just maldev.exe. You as a reverse engineer, it is going to be quite impossible for you to get your hands on the controller itself. All you're going to get is the executable found on the client's machine. So we are going to go through maldev.exe and see how it works. Okay. There are many ways to go about this. I like starting off at export entry. I am a programmer by trade. I can visualize how each function calls another function by looking at the code. For those of you who feel more comfortable with function graph, there is function graph available in Ghidra. But I'm gonna go ahead and keep the defined strings up and I'm gonna double click on entry in which it's already brought me here. So I've done some reverse engineering and I know that the first entry point leads me to something that is usually called 
Uh, it's usually called main CRT startup and C++. This was written in C, but I'm still used to the nomenclature of some of the C++ stuff. So I'm going to rename this one to something that I'm familiar with. I'm going to call it main CRT startup. And you can Google that to get an idea of exactly what is involved in the startup of a C, C++ program. So if it's app type one, do that. If it's app type two, do that. But it ends up that they're both exactly the same. You can figure that out by clicking down on your middle mouse button and they'll highlight all the ones that are the same. Let's double click into it. And then there's a lot more code inside of the CRT startup, but I am just focusing on the, on the code that the original author wrote. And the code that the original author wrote is going to be right here. How do we know that? Because the main program always has a return code, a re an exit code. We see that this program is going to return an exit code. Then based on that exit code, it'll do some exiting processes. So it is very likely that this is going to be your main function. This is where all the heavy lifting is going to be done. So now that I've renamed that, and I rename it by hitting L on my keyboard. Now that I've renamed it, I'm going to double click into it. All right, so this is where the magic happens. So this is a handle to a window. And we're going to go from top to bottom. So we got the handle to the window. And then we got this function here. It's not named, so let's go ahead and see what it is. We're going to double click into it. And this is pretty much just uh, more setup. Uh, there's nothing that really gives it away as what this is. We might come back later, but I'm not worried too much about it right now. Uh, the first thing is going to be this alloc console. So as soon as this program starts, it it makes a command prompt and it allocates that command prompt to this program. And then once it allocates it to that program, it assigns the window handle to whatever command prompt window is available that has the name of console window class. And then it shows the window with the value of one. One means show window, zero means do not show window. For this case, since it's research purposes only, we are absolutely gonna show the window. Uh, so this author, me, makes it where the window is shown. So let's go and jump into this function to see what this is. This is the disclaimer function that the author wrote. This is the disclaimer function that I wrote. So we're gonna go ahead and rename this one to disclaimer. I'm gonna click on that, I'm gonna hit L, and I'm gonna call it this Disclaimer. So as soon as the main the main function starts, it automatically does the next function that is called, and the next function is disclaimer. All right, and what I'm doing is on my keyboard, I'm holding down the Alt button and doing the back left arrow, and that is taking me backwards to the code that I had before. Same thing, you can do Alt and Right and go forward to where you were. So it's pretty much an undo button or a step back. So I stepped in to Disclaimer by double clicking. Now I'm Alt, left arrow to step back out of. All right, then we're gonna check this one. Double click on this and wow. Yeah, this is where the heavy lifting comes into play. So I see a lot of things called, you know, socket internet address, htun for the port, attempting to connect to, connected to. This is gonna be what I'm going to call the reverse shell. Uh, this is the one where the, the, the program is gonna receive the commands, do, do the commands, and then pass it back to the server. I'm gonna call this the reverse shell, just for naming convention. So I'm gonna scroll all the way back up, click on that L, and I'm gonna write in rev shell. All right, and since I'm the reverse engineer, I'm gonna name them however I want, however I'm more comfortable. And they don't have to be exactly right. If it's a printf and all I do is write, you know, standard out, it's whatever makes it easier for me since I'm the one doing the analysis on it. Okay, so from top to bottom, we have all of our variables. I'm gonna leave the variables alone for the time being. We're gonna to go to this WSA startup. So if there's, if there's something in here that you don't understand, go ahead and throw it into Google, see what happens. I believe I already have WSA Startup available, in which WSA Startup initiates, initiates the use of Winsock DLL by process. And return value, if successful, is gonna return zero. 
right, so that sets it up. And here's your, here's the D word along with some more data. And this is the socket itself. So we got the AF and then the type and then the protocol. I'm gonna go ahead and call this one, I'm gonna to attempt to call this one my socket because the last time, or just my socket, last time that I did that, it renamed it just to S. Ghidra has some functions where it can rename some things. All right, this one clearly looks like an IP address. See, and went ahead and renamed that to S. <laughs> Don't know why, but that is the more proper uh, naming convention of it. All right, this is, so this just says two. I have no idea what this is. So I'm going to middle click on it and scroll up and see what else we got. We got address family. So it's already recognized it as an address family. So I'm just going to rename this adder family just so I know later on when I see it. And as you go change some things, Ghidra is automatically going to do analysis by itself and it's going to remove some lines, add some lines and make things a little bit easier to read. All right, here's your internet address and here's your H tons with this. If I hover above that, I'm going to see that it's 8080. So I can either memorize that it's 8080 or I can jump back into my assembly and look at where the pointer is. So here is H tons, but assembly things are pushed on before the commands are called. So we have to look up one. So we have to look up one and it's right here. Um, before I do anything else, I'm going to come up here to the top of this where it says toggle mouse hover pop-ups. I'm going to unclick that. So that way when I hover above something, let's do that again. There we go. Now we got the red circle X. When I hover above something, it's no longer going to pop up. All right. So I want to go right here. I'm going to right click. I'm going to go down to convert near the bottom. It's going to come with a pop up with a whole bunch of different options. I'm going to click unsigned decimal of 8080. Now that I've done that, I can come back to my decompiler and it's going to show 8080 here for me. Okay. So next is these attempting to connect twos and this IP address and things like this. So this is going to be our print to standard out. So once again, I can call it printf or since, actually I believe I wrote this one in uh, C++. I'm gonna call it std out. So it's gonna print to standard out. And then, <laughs> All right, I'm going to come back to this one. Let's click into it real quick and see what we have here. All right, that's all that does. This looks like it could be either a concatenate or a string compare. Looks like it's going to compare this to that. So if that's true, it'll be a string compare, but I'm not going to uh, give it a name just yet. I'm going to keep on going down and see what we find out. So we got this connect a socket to the address family with, if you hover above it, it'll tell you exactly what it is with the name length. And in this case, name length is going to be 16. So let's see exactly what the var is. I want to see what the return of the connect function is in which the connect function will return zero if no errors occur. So what this is trying to say is that it is making that connection to the server. And if the server has no failures, it's going to return back zero. If it does have failures, it's going to come back as negative one. So I'm going to call this, I'm going to call this connect result. All right. So if the connect fails, close the socket and clean it up. All right, so attempting to connect to, if it fails, close it, clean it up. If it does connect, then we are gonna say we have connected to this IP address and that we are now waiting for a command. Okay. And once again, we have this. I'm not sure at this exact moment what it is, but I really do get a feeling that it's gonna be a, a string compare. Let me see, it's the same data type is that, or the same data location is that. All right, let's keep on scrolling down. What else do we got? 
All right, while true, we are going to receive from the socket of that. So I'm going to hover above receive and see that this is a buffer. So I'm going to go ahead and rename this one receive buff. All right. And then we see that we actually initiated receive buffer up here and we actually gave it a PU var. So I'm going to rename this one receive buff as well with an underscore at the very beginning. All right. And then we have a receive buffer of um, 1,024 with the with zero flags. So I want to make this actually say 1,024 by coming back into assembly, finding out where it's at in the assembly code, right clicking, convert, unsigned decimal, bam. Okay. So once again, STD out. And then here's our string compare. So, so we've received something of 1,024 in bytes. And then this is gonna be the receive result. So if the receive result is who am I, it is gonna come back with a zero value. So string compare, receive result with who am I if they're exactly the same and have zero differences, this should be a zero. So I'm gonna call it who result. So that way I can see that the result, if, if it is who am I, that means there are zero changes and if there's zero changes, we're gonna break. This is where comp compilation of programs come into play because the way that I wrote the program is if it is who am I, do stuff. If it is primary working directory, do stuff. But the way that the program compiled this is a little bit different. If it's who am I, break. And then go into primary working directory. If primary working directory is good, then do stuff. So it's gonna look something like this. So this black one is the who am I. For some reason it's breaking. And then it's going straight into this red one, which is gonna be the PWD, the primary working directory. And then it's gonna continue on into the blue. But what is going to be happening here is that once it does everything else, it's going to come back and it's going to continue doing the who am I portion that is going to break on right now. So it is going to come back to it, but it's not exactly the way that I wrote it. That's all part of the compilation and the optimization. So who am I? Break. We'll come back to that later. But if we string compare with what was received and it matches PWD. Then we're going to start doing stuff. So it's going to assign some stuff to the stack, to the variables, to some other variables. But this right here is what I'm interested in. So if it's primary working directory, it's going to run this, this function. And this function is get current directory. So I'm going to just rename this to calls get current directory a this is this is um my reverse engineering i can name it however i want to so as to give me the best idea of what's happening and i see that if this string compares to pwd it's going to do calls to get current directory then it's going to be putting something in the buffer so i'm going to rename this to uh result buffer yep yeah, let's do result buff there we go. And now that I know that this is the buffer, I see that I actually initialized it up here. And I see that it's locally assigning it down here. And then as I scroll down, I see that it actually passes result buffer into a send function. So this send function is going to use the socket S that we had earlier. And it is going to send the result buffer through that socket and this is going to be length. So this is going to be the length of what the result buffer is. So string length of result buffer. So I'm actually going to call this, uh, yeah. Uh, which one was this one? Primary working directory, period WD length. So it's going to send through the socket, the result buffer, that is the length of that with this flag. So this is where we actually send the information back to the server and the server says, 
Roger that, I got it. The primary working directory is the desktop. So once that is done, we are going to memset the result buffer. So what we're gonna do is, we're pretty much clearing out the result buffer by setting a whole bunch of zeros to the result buffer. And how many zeros are we gonna set? We're gonna be setting 257. So I'm gonna jump over here. I'm gonna find out where that 257 is. This is X101. I'm gonna convert that to 257. And here we go. Yep, we're gonna put 257 zeros into the result buffer. So we're zeroing out the result buffer. Same thing with the receive buffer, except we're gonna be doing it 1,024 times. So I'm gonna come here, I'm gonna take this X400, right click, convert, 1,024. Excellent. All right, so we have done the primary working directory. That one's done, that one's good to go. And then we've seen that one for the, um, for the who am I, but we haven't gotten to this part yet. All right. So down here we have a string compare, host name to receive buff. So if the receive buffer is host name, I'm gonna call this host result. If it really is that, then go ahead and start doing stuff. So we're using the same receive buffer that we used earlier. We're putting it at zero. And then we have yet another function that is going to record information to the result buffer. So let's see what that is. Let's double click into it. This is get computer name. So we're, I'm gonna rename this one to calls get computer name A. All right, I'm gonna hit Alt, go back arrow. I'm gonna do it twice. All right, so we see that host name actually calls get computer name A, puts it into the result buffer, and then sends that result buffer through this socket with a string length. Nope, oh, sorry, post length. So I was going to send through the socket the result buffer that came from get computer name with a length of that with this flag. So this is going to send the computer name back to the server, back to the controller. Then once that's done, we're going to do the same thing with the memory. We're going to clear the memory by putting 257 zeros into the result buffer. And same thing with the receive buffer. We're going to be putting... 1,024 zeros into the result buffer and setting it like that. Okay, so host name, calls get computer name, sends it, recess the memory. So we've now done this one as well. All right, so if all goes well, we should get back to who am I sometime in the future. But I do believe that before we get there, it has compiled it so that the disconnect and the exit are the first things that they get processed. So string compare, if the receive buffer equals disconnect, zero means that there are no discrepancies between the two, then go ahead and close the socket, clean up and exit. Same thing with the exit. If the receive buffer is exit, close socket, clean up, exit. So these do the exactly the same inside of maldev.exe. They do different things on the server side. And then we have this chunk of stuff here. So if we hover above it, we get nothing really that can give us any information on what it is. We see that there's a character A. On this one, there's a blank. This one is an M. And this one is the, the new line character. And then zero is the end of a string. Now, if you look at the characters, it's that, it's that backward slash zero. So this is a null terminator string. So I'm wondering if this is actually a full complete string, especially since we got to this, this um, backslash n. So we're gonna look at this, the string length of that. So since this is at the very beginning of a lot of variables that very well could be a string, I do believe that this is a full complete string and that this is the pointer location and that this is a string length of all this. So let's figure out what all this is. I'm gonna jump back over to I'm gonna jump back over to the assembly and we're gonna find out where this is. 
Alright, so if we look at assembly, I hover above this. And then as I'm hovering above it, I'm going to right click on it. We're going to go to convert. And we see that the character sequence is actually INVA. Let's going to change that. Same thing for this one. Same thing for the next. And so on until we get a good idea of what is actually being said here. All right, so invalid command. Okay, so what all these equal out to is invalid command. And this is the very beginning of the invalid command. So we are looking for the string length of the entire sentence of invalid command. So I'm going to call this invalcom length. And so, if it's not, who am I, host name, pri primary working directory, disconnect, or exit, then we are going to reply back with invalid command, and we are going to send that over the socket, and that's going to be the location of where the string starts with that length, so the whole string gets sent with a flag of zero. We're going to send that, and then we're going to memset that entire section with that being the starter with the start point with zeros pretty much zeroing it out for the length of 20. And then same thing with the receive buffer we're going to zero it out with the length of 1024. And once again you can check that out by hovering above it and looking inside of the decimal column of the pop-up box. Alright so far we've covered everything except for the who am I part. So I see some extra code down here. My expectation is that this extra code is going to be from the who am I. So let's check it out. So we once again have a result buffer. We've seen that on every single command so far. The primary working directory set up the result buffer. The get host name set up the result buffer. My expectation is that this who am I sets up the result buffer. So the result buffer is here. It also records it to a local variable. But we see this function that saves information to the result buffer. We pass it in a result buffer. It's going to re record something to that buffer. And we're going to be able to call that buffer later. So let's go ahead and double click into this. And of course, there is our get username, which makes sense for the who am I command. So calls get username a bam. All right, I'm going to alt uh, back arrow, back arrow, back arrow out of this. All right, cool. So once it Saves it to result buffer. It's going to do some more things with the result buffer, but ultimately we're going to find out the string length of that result buffer. I'm going to call it who length, in which we are going to send using the socket that we have set up the result buffer, which is going to be the computer name that we get from get username. Let's try that again. We're going to send with the socket the result buffer that is going to have the username that we get from get username a with a length of that with a flag of zero and then we are going to put 257 zeros into the buffer and set that memory same thing we're going to zero out the receive buffer by putting 1024 zeros into the result buffer and then we are going to continue doing that until the connection is broken by the server Okay, so that, that is going to be it. We now have a very good idea of what maldev.exe does. Thank you all for joining me in reverse engineering maldev.exe. Please let the YouTube algorithm know that you like this video by clicking that like button. And also comment, let me know how you're doing with this and if you have any questions. And please subscribe to this channel. Thank you all again. And until next time, keep reversing.